All right, just a thumbs up. We can see the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Wonderful. All right, uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, this is a paper I started uh, almost exactly one year ago as part of the qualitative research class um, in my doctoral program with the wonderful Dr. Parker. Uh, the title of my project is an intrinsic case study exploring the socialization of pre-service teachers in oral skills classes. Uh, this is for obviously Desert Skies and I'm from Temple University. So uh, a little bit just of background on how I got to this study. During my work as a uh, TA in general music classes, I had some experience working with pre-service music teachers and started to wonder about how they viewed their oral skills as part of their teaching. I witnessed a whole range of um, ability and application in these classes. And as a result, I uh, wanted to investigate this a little bit. One of the things I did see was a sometimes disconnect between the oral nature of music and the way that students were actually choosing to teach it in their peer teaching. Um, in doing this research, I ch checked out the National Association of Schools Music Handbook, and uh, they do prescribe that oral analysis and oral dictation are essential competencies for pre-service music teachers. So something that all future music teachers should have uh, some comfort in doing. So I'll get a little bit into the literature and then we'll talk about the actual study. Um, most research on oral skills has been done around oral acquisition. So how do you learn your oral skills? Um, notably, Karp Karpinski, Gretzmacher, and Bonveri have published a number of articles and books on the topic. Um, in addition to application, a number of researchers have looked at correlations between RO skills and other musical skills, uh, such as sight reading um, or rhythm reading. And generally, there's a positive correlation between RO skills and other musical skills. Although Weeks uh, 2015 found that there was not a correlation between instrumental performance and RO skills, suggesting that you can play your instrument really well and not really understand what you're playing at all. Beyond just looking at oral skills, part of this project was to look at socialization factors for pre-service music teachers. Excuse me, no, let me go back. I missed that last point here. Okay, the most relevant literature to this study is uh, studies about the application of oral skills in teaching. Uh, Oye uh, looked at applied teachers or private teachers and how they use oral skills and found generally that they don't. Um, Dunmount, 2016, uh, interviewed or, excuse me, surveyed choral conductors and found that they valued oral skills and their ability to detect rhythmic and harmonic errors in rehearsal. Dorkson compared uh, pre-service teachers to expertise or expert teachers and found that they listened to recordings in fundamentally different ways. Um, experienced teachers tend to notice things like tone and blend, while pre-service teachers tend to notice things like intonation. Finally, uh, Sheldon uh, 1998 looked at uh, relationships between solfege and um, pre-service music teachers' ability to detect errors and found a positive correlation. Now on to socialization. Handel 1998 described socialization as the process of acquiring beliefs, values, skills, and resources needed to live and participate in society or a profession. During the pivotal secondary phase of socialization, usually occurring during or shortly after university years. Teachers undergo a reshaping of their understanding of their role identities, often fraught with competing influencers, including private instructors, ensemble directors, music education faculty, parents, peers, and their own teaching experience. Within the music education literature, Austin, Isabel, and Russell um, surveyed four institutions about who pre-service music teachers were most influenced by in their undergrad experience and found that the performance faculty and the performance culture was the most prominent influence of socialization in music schools. This has been confirmed by other researchers, including Bouge, Robert, and Nettle. This is a fairly common, commonly accepted um, characteristic of socialization in music schools. So for this particular project, I'm looking at oral skills, and I'm looking at socialization of future music teachers and putting them together, and that is the deficit that is, this study is filling. 
So my research questions. How do pre-service music teachers describe their own aural skills learning experience? How do pre-service music teachers describe the application of aural skills in their teaching? And what socialization factors or role models contribute to pre-service music teachers' understanding of the applications of aural skills in their music teaching? For my methodology, I chose an intrinsic case study because I wanted to look at uh, sort of just an ordinary oral skills class. Nothing special about this one. Um, just the ordinary, the partic the, nothing particularly interesting about this one. It just happened to be one music education oral skills class. Uh, I purposely sampled from the final semester of oral skills at a university in the eastern United States. I wanted to make sure that all my participants had gotten all the way through the oral skills track and they could reflect on that as well as their music education experience. So I pulled only music education students. Um, you can see the chart below uh, uh, displays the characteristics. I have pseudonyms for each of them. Um, gender identities, primary instrument, and then also previous high school theory experience. Note that I did have uh, one participant had perfect pitch, which is often something noted in oral skills research because um, people with perfect pitch sometimes have a different experience in the oral skills classroom. Phase one of the research included individual interviews and two classroom observations. This was just before COVID, so I was actually able to sit in on those and conduct those in person. Um, based on those, I used in vivo and descriptive coding um, to start to develop some codes and some ideas about their responses to the interviews. Um, I uh, consulted with a peer coder who helped me come up with a code book um, before moving on to phase two, where I did um, two focus groups, and this was post-COVID, so this one was done, those were done on Zoom, and using the peer codes from, so using the code book from my peer coding um, then analyze the focus groups and reanalyze the interviews um, to come to broader, more meaningful themes. Okay, now the fun stuff, finding. So what did we actually find out? First of all, uh, participants experienced an increased perception of their own oral ability and the value of oral skills in teaching. This is not terribly surprising. We expect students to get better at oral skills over the course of their four semesters and uh, they, you might expect them also to see increased value in their potential teaching this. Second, there are context-specific applications of oral, schools, uh, oral, oral skills in teaching music, meaning depending on what context you're in, whether or not you're in a large ensemble, in a general music classroom, in a private lesson, those determine what type of oral skills pre-service music teachers anticipate using. And then finally, unique socialization factors, depending on the, this context. So in each of these contexts, there tend to be a certain role model um, that influences participants more so than in other contexts. So at that first theme, um, many participants expressed a lot of confusion around their first experience in oral skills. But throughout the track of the course, they established some confidence and um, came to value them a lot more. So almost everyone felt like they had grown a lot. Uh, here's a wonderful quote, and here is where I need some audience participation. So if someone wouldn't mind being Rachel for me and reading this quote right here, I can't see anyone. Does someone want to jump in and read Rachel's quote? Thank you, Andrew. It's so weird to think a year ago, I couldn't listen to two notes and know what interval it is. And now you can play me any two notes and I can tell you what the interval is. That was crazy to me, even last year. So it was really overwhelming at first, but now it's kind of more accessible. Thank you. And this was mirrored by other participants who expressed that their increased comfort in a variety of oral skills. Um, in addition to just being more comfortable, they saw them as more important. So Laura said probably uh, that oral skills are probably one of the most important parts of our future teaching. Additionally, Rachel said, I didn't think oral skills were something, I didn't know they really existed before I came to college. Now I'm really glad that I have some of them. So obviously a lack of exposure in high school would mean that um, music students might not understand exactly what oral skills are or why they were important, but through the process of taking these classes that uh, became apparent. Almost every single participant mentioned the importance of solfege in this process. And so I just wanted to note that because it came up so frequently um, across participants. Okay, looking, uh, moving on to theme number two, 
context specific application. So again, depending on where participants were thinking about teaching or within what context, they had different ideas about what oral skills they might use. Let me just adjust my notes. Um, Participants saw the application of oral creativity and interaction as more important in general music settings. The application of sight singing and leading technical exercises as more important in large ensembles, and the application of intonation and harmonic awareness as more important in performance or applied lessons. So in the general music context, participants talked about there being less of an emphasis on notation that the teaching interactions tended to be more interactive in nature, and there is increased importance on creativity. Do I have a volunteer to read for Laura? Thank you, Erica. I was gonna read the last one and then my dog was barking, so. No worries. <laughs> you're, kind, you're kind of like disguising it with play and making those physical associations. When the scarf would drop or you pull it off and then you sing the resting tone, it's just like you're playing, but you're also making these associations between tonic and dominant. And so it's still getting there, but not the same way. Thank you. Yeah, so participants saw General music is a place where there's more interactions between teachers and students. And because of that, there were specific needs, uh, specific oral skills needs that would that went along with that. In contrast to the general music setting, participants talked about um, straightforward ensembles, someone actually said that, um, or large ensembles or applied lessons. In this context, they found that uh, running choral warmups and working on sight singing was the place that they would use their oral skills the most. Um, some very interesting quotes about the difference in interaction in large ensembles, or um, we might say secondary ensembles. So Rachel says, my conductor was showing us how to do things, but not literally making music like sound and stuff with us, which I think happens a lot more in the general music setting. So she's, she's clearly saying there that I see this as different than the general music setting. And when we're when there's a conductor up there, I mean, in a large ensemble, there's less interaction. They're not they're not doing as much with us. Similarly, um, Emily agreed. This was the same focus group. You think about like when you're in an ensemble, or if I'm a choir, my choir director isn't going to hop up and sing with us and make music in that way. So clearly, a, again, a, a differentiation between how oral skills gets used in the general music classroom and in the large ensemble. Similarly. Participants talked about how oral skills were applied in their individual lessons or their applied lessons. Here was the uh, probably the context in which it was clear that they had experienced the least amount of oral skills. So I had one participant even say something like, I literally have never talked about oral skills in my flute lessons before. Um, so there's a limited application of there, but where it does come up is in issues of intonation and harmonic tendency, tendency which I was uh, interested to hear. So do we have one last person to be Abigail? I can't see everyone, so... Yes, thank you, Joseph. Is it big enough? Yep. yep. I guess you kind of like hear the intervals. I don't know how to describe it. It's like if you play an interval that doesn't sound perfect, then you'll know that it's the kind of out of tune, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so a number of people actually mentioned um, using oral skills in the context of um, intonation in their instrumental lessons, which was fascinating. Moving right along. So getting into some discussion about what all this means. Um, so just to recap, pre-service teachers saw their applications as different in different contexts. They saw general music as being more back and forth and more interactive. And they saw the large ensembles as being less interactive and more of a one-way interaction. This confirms some findings by Reese in her 2019 article that pre-service music teachers tend to strongly differentiate the general music classroom and the instrumental or large ensemble. One interesting thing about the large ensemble context, oops, in, um, in a lot of the oral skills literature, people talk about error detection as being a skill for future teachers. This is not something that came up particularly much um, often in this, even asking directly, how are you going to use your oral skills when you're a conductor? Or how are you going to use it when you're a band director? Only one participant pointed out that uh, the idea of identifying errors in student playing was a key uh, 
part of that teaching context. Um, similar to the OIA 2013 um, findings, there was not a whole lot of application of oral skills in the applied lesson. That tends to be someplace where um, instructors maybe really aren't talking about oral skills a whole lot. One participant brought up an authentic teaching experience, which I thought was really interesting. She's actually the same participant who pointed out, uh, brought up error detection. Um, and I, I suspect this is because she was the only one who referenced an authentic teaching experience. So she talked about a um, weekend strings uh, program that she teaches in, and she related some of that directly to her own oral skills, talking about teaching intonation to those students. Um, so this suggests that when students, pre-service music teachers, have authentic teaching um, experiences, they are more likely to connect them back to their coursework. All right, um, as far as who is in, uh, who participants were relying on in their socialization, um, generally the context de determined the socialization factor. So um, when, when they were talking about large ensembles, they would refer to the conductor and say, I saw the conductor do this, or I saw my director do this. When they were speaking about general music classrooms, oftentimes they would reference music education faculty who were teaching those classes. And when they were discussing individual lessons, obviously they um, would refer to their teachers. This sort of correlates or corresponds with previous findings by Bouge, Austin, and all, and Seeger, that there is a stronger performance culture. Um, the performance culture more strongly influences students in music school than the education. So despite the fact that in regarding general music, um, participants cited music education faculty, they spent more time talking about their ensemble directors and their private instructors. Um, one thing that came up in the Austin study was just the institutional differences. And I wanted to point this out because every institution is different. Um, and so this may not obviously be representative of all institutions. Um, the university where I did this research has a fairly strong uh, music learning theory approach and that may have influenced the way that students were thinking about specifically in um, general music their applications of oral skills. So uh, just to wrap things up very broadly, we fi I found that on the performance end of things um, applied teachers tended to use oral skills less, and as a result, our pre-service music teachers are thinking about using oral skills the least in performance settings and attributing that to their applied teachers. The secondary ensemble or the large ensemble is sort of in the middle. They are citing either their high school directors or the university directors, and there's some sense of applying oral skills in those contexts, but not as much as there is in the general music context where they cited faculty members as being their strongest influence. Uh, implications for further research, obviously there's a lot more to be done here. Um, actually no, sorry, implications first and then further research. <laughs> so implications. Um, my thought is that, that ensemble directors and uh, private instructors probably could do more to specifically show how they are applying their oral skills in their teachers to model that for future teachers. Also, um, music ed faculty might do more to sort of make the connections with the instrumental or the ensemble experience, um, even in general music classes or in other settings. One thing that didn't come up in this study was other sort of other music ed areas. So technology, composition, arranging, modern band, community, participatory music. Um, and it would be interesting to find out more about where those socialization factors came in. So for further research, I would suggest that we need more studies like this that focus on in-service teachers. So how do teachers who are actually practicing use their RL skills? More quantitative measures of um, socialization. So uh, I was thinking even like some kind of survey that measured um, the extent to which uh, participant accredited certain people in, in their socialization. Um, and then obviously just like talking, uh, looking more into role models in other music education realms. If you are interested in my references, here's the link. There were too many to fit on a slide, but you can check them out if you would like. And that is 28 minutes. So I'm going to wrap things up. Sorry, 20 minutes at 28.
Thanks, Peter.